my name is Anna Kuliberda. I'm representing Fundacja TechSoup, which is a part of TechSoup Global Network. And I'm very happy that uh, we can speak about social innovation uh, here at Personal Democracy Forum. Personal democracy is an innovation itself, but what we want to explore here is uh, what is the social innovation and how to play with it and how not to get burned. Uh, so that's why I invited three amazing panelists, which only two has glasses, as you can see. And we, um, and we will talk about it, but also there will be space uh, for you to contribute as well. Um, so let me start with introducing everybody, or maybe waiting just for a second more, so everybody can see it and feel comfortable. Maybe even in the first row. <laughs> um, yeah, please see it. <laughs> so I welcome everybody uh, who, are, who decided to be here. I know that we have a lot of uh, competition. And <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce my uh, great panelist, uh, uh, Maria Novkovic. Maria is from UNDP Montenegro, but she has um, a lot of experience in anti-corruption, transparency, and integrity. She's an uh, open government partnerships uh, specialist. And also in 2012, she, um, she was part of the project, from 2012, she was part of the project of petitioning platform Citizens Voice in Montenegro, and also she's a blogger from for UNDP blog Eurasia. So um, this is a very good blog, actually. If you haven't seen it, I, I use a lot of examples from this blog. So uh, I recommend it, uh, not only because I know Maria. And uh, Michał Mach, the only person without glasses, <laughs> he is co-founder of Civic CRM Poland, as well as, as InfoZmiana Initiative. And Michał is like an institution here in Warsaw. He's an entrepreneur, a trainer, a trainer, a consultant, a project manager, software designer, but most of all, I believe he's an activist, an activist from in the world of, an IT activist among NGOs and an NGO activist among hackers. So this is like a very schizophrenic position. However, he deals with it like perfectly, I believe. And third is uh, our guest, uh, Alexis Sidorenko, who is the director of Teplica of social technology. Teplica is an incubator of social technology. It's a project that is developed in Russia, but Alex is based in Warsaw. And uh, he's an expert of Russian internet and uh, three years of being reporter for Global Voices about Russia. And from February 2012, He's developing this uh, social technology incubator. And what is important, like in terms of social innovation, in 2010, Alex helped developing Help Map, which was a crowdsourced proje project initiative to help the victims of summer wildfires. So it was awarded, but also really helpful to the people. And um, so these are my, my guests. And the topic of this session is social innovation. And to begin, uh, I would like to say something what do I understood under the social innovation, but what also we talked a lot while preparing to this session, what a social innovation is for us. So um, there is, it has two angles, the social innovation. First of all, these are methods, how to think creatively about the reality, how to think about hacking the reality. So not to follow the usual paths with usual suspects, how to think outside the box. And there are a lot of methods from different, um, different societies, mostly IT societies, that just allow people to think freely. And my question here, one of many, is whether it can be easily applied to our activist NGO world or whether we are too structurized uh, to actually be able to use it as it was designed. Uh, the second part of social innovation, these are the tools. This is what we usually call 
social innovation. So crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and mapping and whatever you can do with new technologies, but also uh, whatever you can do with hardware, for example. So most of all, when I started to think about this session, I, was, I reminded myself the situation when I was telling my hacker friend about the problem that uh, we as watchdogs we have. And uh, he said, oh, I didn't know it is a problem. We have a solution for that. I said, oh, I didn't know there is a solution for that. So this is what I would like to achieve within using social innovation methods to have a social innovation tool to solve like our usual activist problems. Um, so to begin optimistically, I would like to ask my panelists, what are the most inspiring examples of social innovation for you? Um, well, I think th if we're speaking of examples, and I'm not sure if it's uh, open, I think that th those are the projects that combine several factors. And uh, the most important factor is the actual need of crowdsourcing. Then the second factor is the offline community behind this that is able not to use uh, this tool as a supplement to their activity. Uh, because online activity itself, it's, you know, like it wouldn't be successful in the long term. And obviously the third thing is a story, is a story behind the crowdsourcing tool. And I think that um, and that's where the journalists are needed very much. So I think if I would tell uh, about the project, uh, it's, it's called Rosyama. Uh, it was um, a pop uh, promoted by a famous, right now almost political, uh, activist called Alexei Navalny. And the good thing is that uh, it not just helps to map potholes on the streets, it's important thing that it uh, went further from the regular Rushahidi maps that we all know, and like there are thousands now since 2010. But the point is that it allows to create an impact by uh, producing uh, the legal complaint that you can really send to the authorities and make them fix it. And so far, uh, this project uh, had helped to fix almost 10,000 potholes uh, with by using uh, the uh, simple tool of uh, PDF creation based on some legal template. Uh, the, another thing here is that it uses open source and therefore, and its creator said, well, we're no, uh, not afraid of the competition. You can do the same stuff or you can do for any kind of pro problem that, is, that looks alike, where you can r map something, report it, make a picture of it, and then create a legal complaint. So if you could open the next website called Rosdostup, and it was created with a little help of a project that I'm leading. It's about accessibility for people with disabilities. So we just, instead of creating something that would take, a, take us lots of resources, we would just simply use the same tool uh, with, I don't know, like with a few weeks of adjusting it and, you know, like, uh, and legal work because you have to adjust the legal templates to change it and there, and, you know, like, just a different set of icons. And we use the power of reusability of tools. And I think that uh, this is what also Omidyar uh, uh, network representatives were uh, uh, speaking about, that as soon as we have the open source, it's really cool uh, that we can uh, do so much more than, we may, than if we use the proprietary tools or we use it just for ourselves. Uh, and Therefore, the same uh, tool, the same framework can be translated. We know that there is Ukryama, which is the same f site for fixing potholes in Ukraine and so on. And then the same mechanism, we, which is about the um, uh, offline impact, was implemented in another website also like under the, mm, uh, under the promotion of Alexei Navalny. And also it's important to know that he, because he's such a popular figure, so he actually can accumulate the so-called network effect. Uh, and it means that the, the higher network effect, the, the more people are using it, the, uh, the massive 
impact of the crowdsourcing tool is. So if you could just click to the next website, you know, just to show. And uh, it also uses the same kind of a uh, open, uh, open source mechanism, but it's about local communal problems, about uh, uh, the entry, uh, entry parts of the buildings, because Russia is mostly a country after the communist w of multi-story buildings and not all the you know like lobbies there look nice so they actually created a tool which already st for within f several months already 40,000 reports and problems were reported to the website and uh, about several thousand already fixed and it's also like I'm speaking about the fixing because this offline impact I think that's all so far and I'm this one. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, I have to say. And in addition to what Anna said before, I also have to disclose that I am a form former civil servant, so I apologize if my thinking is a bit <laughs> tainted by that perspective. Uh, so are my examples, unfortunately, um, or fortunately so, because I do not believe that social innovation is only reserved for for the citizens because civil servants are also citizens of their societies and they also can uh, think along the lines of um, innovation and I've seen some examples uh, where I work. Um, I do like how uh, EU Commissioner for Digital Agenda, Ms. Neely Cruz, uh, opened up her uh, speeches for public commentary. Um, that, that's rather cool and it really shows a lot of um, self-confidence. Um, I am a big fan of uh, all sorts of visualizations of public spending. Um, I think that's very relevant uh, because it's key information that someone condensed for us, analyzed it, and put it in a framework where it tells us a story. And let's not forget it's also in a visually appealing way and it helps us to think about how public uh, monies are, are being spent. And, and for example, where are my taxes going was uh, part of the insp inspiration for a project on visualizing the budget in Montenegro that we are rolling out um, pretty soon. I'm also, uh, like Alex uh, said, a big fan of uh, Fix My Street and all its variants um, for one simple reason. It's really brought down to the local level. It's where um, it re relates to, citizen, uh, to our daily uh, lives and it's where we are most knowledgeable. So in the words of the Major of Cal Calgary in Canada, uh, he said that the best expert on public transport is the lady who takes the bus every day. Uh, and we are the best experts for the problems in our, in our communities and we should be the best place to report them and to solve them, why not? And it's a huge win for the government too uh, because uh, for two reasons at least. Um, number one, uh, it's like government is outsourcing a bit of its functions to the citizens because it, it's about citizens reporting and they, the government basically can have many, many eyes on the ground. And number two, if there are follow-ups to these citizen reports um, in these types of uh, web platforms, then it can help um, boost public trust and confidence and um, which government doesn't want to be liked, <laughs> seriously. Um, and also, uh, I was really impressed how Iceland crowdsourced its constitution and how Finland rolled out the Open Ministry uh, platform for uh, crowdsourcing uh, uh, legislation. And to bring things closer to home, I am a big fan, a big fan of the online communications team of the government of uh, Croatia. And they, to my understanding, um, post some 110 uh, reactions or interactions on Facebook a day. They even put up uh, YouTube uh, interviews um, where basically ministers respond to citizens' queries. So the communication between the citizens and the government is really uh, interactive. It's two-way and it's close to uh, real time. And it's funny how they actually started. Um, this, the online uh, communications team for the government is the same team from the election campaign uh, for the opposition um, parties. So they in a way won the elections because they relied on social media for campaigning purposes and then the, the citizens simply got spoiled because they were getting a lot of in, in, uh, interaction and someone was listening to them. And then so when the, the opposition won the elections, th th there was just no turning back because <laughs> they were already used. The public was used to interacting uh, online so via social media. So those are my picks. As I said, they are a bit on the government, <laughs> government side. 
uh, okay. I don't have any slides, uh, but I would like to tell you about my uh, biggest inspiration so far when it comes to something that could be called social innovation, but the example is from something around 10 or 15 years ago, uh, so I don't think this term existed back then. Uh, there was an organization uh, which might still exist actually, uh, called uh, Geek Core, uh, and that was one of the organizations who was expediting people with skills and the knowledge uh, about uh, so-called new technologies, uh, electronics, IT, uh, networking, uh, to developing countries. And they were thrown into uh, local context, which wasn't really uh, that uh, pink and full of resources. And they were dealing with the situation uh, all the mm, like, all the possible ways that they could figure out um, in order to solve some problems. So one of the, I, I think many of you might have heard the, mm, this example. One of the uh, examples of of their work was building um, networks using uh, tin cans. So basically, there was no network equipment to connect like two villages. So they would take uh, tin cans, which uh, in a time contained some meat or fruits, uh, and they would uh, get some like one dollar parts and a piece of cable and build a uh, long range antenna uh, out of it and basically provide connectivity to some distant uh, place, uh, in some distant village. Or they would take uh, like one natural resource which was uh, available um, um, freely, which was uh, animal manure, and in short, turn it into electricity, and so on, so on. Uh, so um, I would say th this is the, the um, this kind of activity where a person with skills, knowledge, um, um, and will to uh, solve uh, some... Um, some specific problems that they see around them. Mm, I would call this is my perfect uh, kind of, of social innovation, either though it might be small scale. It might not change the life of nations, but it might change life of just a few people. Uh, so I would say maybe, maybe my, my take on social innovation, um, on the scale of many different social innovations, I admire most those little ones which happen at the beginning, which uh, change everything completely around, but they might not be very, uh, very mm, uh, widespread or lar large scale. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, in this sense, I'm a fan of this bleeding edge of social innovation, which I guess might not be called social innovation yet. Afterwards, when uh, those models figured out by, by skillful people are, are spread out and, and uh, popularized, then this might get tagged as a social innovation. At the beginning, it's just a problem solving and being resourceful about it. So, so mm, yeah, that's, that's, it's been 15 years and I'm still amazed by those projects and still amazed and inspired by by uh, uh, by that. As it's a very good point and a great beginning to my second question uh, about social innovation diffusion. So, from your point of view, one solution will not fit all, definitely. However, we can see that there is like innovation via inspiration. So, fix my street and. Uh, the repetition of it. Uh, however, I always um, afraid when I'm looking at new ideas that uh, it will just stack, you know, when the people are willing to use it and they are just uh, creative and they want to try new things. And my question from your exp experience and from your point of view, how to uh, make innovation happening everywhere? or whether it's not innovation anymore, 
and this like institutionalization of innovation. How do you think? Yeah, sure. I was really struck by uh, when you said, uh, are people willing to use uh, some of these newly produced, uh, rolled out tools? I think there lies the key because social innovation, as I understand it, is uh, citizens solving the problems themselves that they perceive in their daily lives. So all of those frustrations that they um, have when, for example, they interact with the public administration, they, that's, that creates space for some thinking on how to overcome it because no one wants to be frustrated. Uh, and it happens a lot in, in dealing with, with these, these kinds of uh, administrative systems. But really getting people uh, to use it is only uh, possible if it uh, is an answer to their problem and if the technological uh, solution is uh, something that they are comfortable with. So to make an example, okay, we rolled out e-petitions in Montenegro and we are the first country in the, reg in the broader Western Balkan, Balkan region to have um, uh, this kind of platform where the citizens, the way we were designing it uh, and why we were designing it is for them to have direct impact on policy making. Uh, it's a great noble cause but the reality is that um, internet penetration is only about 50% in, in Montenegro, in my country. Uh, and uh, many people are saying that we cannot really uh, enter into online uh, participation if we haven't solved the offline uh, one. Um, some numbers for you in the first uh, three months of uh, the platform's operation, we've we've had 14 petitions submitted by by the citizens, which in a way is good. It's a success. Only one of them managed to pass the threshold of 6,000 signatures, which is uh, approximately 1% of the of the whole population. Um, and then it was voted by the government again. Great, uh, because it was not uh, just neglected or ignored and the government uh, promised they would take out a huge loan uh, and resolve this problem in 2016. Um, so one wonders about political efficacy of, of these things. Um, so there, there's a very simple equation. Um, people will participate and use these tools if they believe their actions will have impact. Uh, and the more they believe in their own political efficacy, the more they will participate. So it's very, it's a very sensitive uh, matter, and it, it has to do with expectations, because we are investing our time in these things. Thank you, yeah. Alex. Well, uh, unlike Maria, who comes from the more governmental perspective, uh, I'm coming from the civil society uh, uh, perspective because our main task is to help civil society organizations. And mm, I, well, first of all, we, we may ask, like, do people really need social innovation? But when it comes to the civil society, and obviously we can ask, like Vladimir Putin would, like, why do, do people need civil society? Well, <laughs> let's leave it outside of uh, discussion. But th it turns out that in order to provide certain services that you know, the market forces cannot cannot provide, so like civil society needs to be really efficient in their work, and ICT is a real amplifier of their abilities. And, uh, w and obviously, uh, the assumption, uh, to my mind, that NGOs and civil society needs, um, uh, needs innovations uh, need, uh, is true. So uh, here, I would say that there are three main things uh, that are very important. First of all, it comes and it starts with imagination. In order to innovate, people need to know that, you know, like there is something going on. They, because w we work with a lot of um, uh, NGOs in Russia, and a lot of them do not know about even about hackathons. They do not know about lots of cool stuff that is uh, happening here. They w they once uh, seen the Ushahidi, and you know, like oh, like th there is a map. Okay, but. Map is 2010 thing or even 2008 thing. Uh, you know what's 2013 thing. Uh, and in order to keep this imagination working, and the uh, uh, well, uh, Jeremy Zermeran was speaking of uh, sharing and copying culture, uh, and I think that, that that's important. We we need to kind of a, a 
first of all, build, build networks and to spread the signals. And especially when it comes to uh, those contacts, those environments where well, English language may not be even knowable to the peop to the people. It means to like to to many uh, quite to, like large countries like Russia, China, Iran, lots of countries where the uh, English language penetration not just internet penetration, uh, is not high. Um, so we need to spread the signal, in ignite their imagination. Then uh, the second thing, we need to say that the technology is not a black magic. And of course there are lots of companies that, are, uh, that make their profit of explaining like, well, that's so difficult, that's so hard, that you better not get into this, let us do the thing and we will have our money. Well, I think that this is against the idea of the social innovation. And I think that uh, open source and creative commons are things that are definitely uh, not just, you know, like break these barriers uh, of uh, having, not having an imagination of what people can do, but also breaking these barriers of what can be done with not so much effort. Of, of course, skills are needed, but people are, you know, like they learn to do new things all their history at least, well, uh, last, wh whatever, like 80,000 years from now on. Um, yeah, so I think that that's another thing, and this is how we can, and third thing, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, is that we need to realize that in order to, uh, for example, in, in the civil society sector, there are lots of traditional activists, uh, and they'll take tech people, and they speak on, even they speak the same language, they speak still different languages, S like tech language and the uh, humanitarian languages, and they simply do not understand each other. They do not know what they can offer to each other. So the idea is that there should, if they can't do it themselves, uh, we should, we need a special group of people, the translators. Uh, Ethan Zuckerman in, uh, in Boston calls such people bridge people, bridging bloggers, bridging people, so that will create, that will build a bridge between different groups and not just different nations when it comes to the conflict, but also different groups that have different types of skills or some that has skills and some that have uh, ideas and want to, uh, and do, are doing good just because they do, that they can do. So I think that, yeah, so uh, imagination, not a black magic thing, and uh, g people who can connect uh, people that comes from different planets. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. These are, like, especially I would like to focus later, when Michal will answer, on the question on the how to ignite imagination. This is like think big and this is so inspiring. In, even in words, like ignite imagination, it just brings this image in the head that it can be just amazing. So let's back to the diffusion of innovation and then we'll definitely talk about imagination. Uh, one very quick thing, I, I want to save my fellow panelists from, from uh, potential trouble. You never know when Richard Stallman is on the, uh, <laughs> in the room. So <laughs> open source, yes, but in general I would uh, rather say free and open source software uh, which is, <laughs> because open source is just one <laughs> part of it. <laughs> oh, there you go, Richard Stallman. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, so just, just to, to uh, avoid, uh, avoid confusion here. Uh, and when it comes to dispersion of social innovation, uh, well, I, I kind of agree with uh, almost everything uh, mm, that Alex said. Uh, so, in order not to repeat uh, um, uh, what has been already said, I would kind of blow my horn and say, um, like, continue uh, from my previous uh, um, words. Uh, we have, basically, in all the communities, we have people who, uh, well, have ideas, who self-ignite, <laughs> Uh, who, 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 who has like very resourceful um, imagination. And uh, my kind of idea fix is to, to, um, to build communities, I would say not around them, but including them. And uh, whenever there, is, there, there are people uh, who have certain problem, certain, uh, certain uh, need, 
and people who are resourceful, who who um, have skills to to solve different problems, and third condition, they will talk, they will save uh, with each other in this room. Um, then again, this is my kind of uh, <coughs> fundamentalist practitioner opinion. So so don't take it as as uh, mm, as generic recipe. But once those two kinds of people are in the room and they want to talk, the solution will get created, or however you want to call it. Uh, this is my belief, right? And uh, I, think, I think this is the way to go. Okay, so I was, to this, I was present at many situations when IT people like those who know that IT is not a black magic, and people in need different, with different problems, they were in the same room. And I believe, and I also have faith, however, I've seen a lot of problems. So, uh, how to actually make it real, like the conversation, and then how to ignite one's other imagination, not to stop, not to create barriers, whether this is this person who is uh, like a bridge person, actually need it, or if we just bring one group and the other group and make a big bang, can this social innovation just happen? Or what is needed to be done? Uh, like for example, uh, hackathons, they not, they, they're not always the best idea. Like from my perspective, I've been participating in few. Usually somebody who is very much willing to uh, to offer knowledge, but not maybe the, the brightest, the newest. It's like when people need a website, and, and the expert says, oh no, not, an, uh, not a website, an app, a mobile app for Android. And then there's like, oh, uh, okay. So uh, this person who is supposed to be helping is creating obstacles that are creating this black magic um, approach, unfortunately. So um, I know, Michal, and I would like to come back to you. You're a very good bridge person. Can you say something more about how actually you work with organizations and with IT people? Like, what are your tips? How to make it happen? Uh, tips. <laughs> uh, okay, so, you, you know, I, I started with this grand belief of mine and you are bringing me down to earth now. <laughs> but okay, I'll deal with, I'll deal with it. Um, mm. Okay, so, so in general my belief is that uh, given enough security in the conversation, given enough time, given enough uh, time to get to know each other in a longer term, those people will solve the problem in the dialogue, in, in exchange uh, of ideas. Uh, but this is this is the perfect world, right? Uh, given the hackathon lasts for a week and we have uh, all the equipment that we need and uh, uh, everyone is very secure and very open about discussing uh, all the possibilities and, and uh, problems and solutions, uh, given all those conditions, problems will be solved, but this will not ever happen. And also, mm, when it comes to tips, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm a, f again, fundamentalist practitioner, and to some extent I tend not to think about general mm, rules and solutions. Put me in a situation where I have uh, uh, people with problem and people with, with skills, and I'll try to do my best to, to, to um, provide the solution. I guess um, my only tip would be uh, um, facilitate the openness and, and uh, the, the um, safety of the conversation because we are, at the end we are talking about uh, social innovation and stuff like this uh, think about it social innovation is a change people are consciously or unconsciously afraid of a change even if there is good at the end of the day 
the process of, of introducing this change might be painful, might be, might be difficult to, to, uh, to grip by those beneficiaries who are supposed to, to, um, to win on this change. Uh, so, so I guess my, my recipe would be to, to go towards uh, like real in-depth conversation and cooperation. Uh, and from here, I would go in many different directions because this can be you know, a hackathon where, where um, proper facilitator provides like really secure and safe atmosphere for conversation or some kind of institutional solution where, where people are not afraid to innovate and are not afraid to, to um, basically make mistakes. Uh, but I, I won't. I, I, I will stay at this, at this very low level uh, of, of uh, conversation and trying to understand each other. And I totally understand uh, the example that you are giving, and because I was also facilitating many of the hackathons where, where uh, people would meet and uh, they would work together, uh, but at the end of the day there was no real solution. They basically did something. For me, mm, that was a scratch on the surface. They started talking. So maybe in a large scope of things, uh, grand scheme of things, uh, they, uh, they will start talking more and they will stand, start understanding each other more and, and uh, the change will happen eventually. Uh, yeah, so, so my only tip would be communicate. Thank you, and since you're like a freelancer here, and Maria and Alex, they have, a, they have projects and they have results to be delivered. They actually, like Maria is doing a, a contest in Montenegro for good uh, solutions to, to problems, as far as I remember. So you have a project framework and a timeline, and how do you deal with this problem? Can I say? Even though my UNDP colleagues are in the room, sometimes I improvise too. <laughs> so no fixed plans yet. Um, but also to revert to what um, Michal was saying about how can we best uh, capitalize in, in social innovation. I think the, one of the problems of hackathons is that they are limited in time. So there is always that pressure we have to deliver in 48 hours or whatever the time format is. Um, maybe that's that's something that we should uh, take into account when we consider social innovation. Um, again, um, we've heard many times today, and I'm super excited about that, that internet uh, is uh, gives us the power of universal participation, and that anyone can be a publisher, anyone can be an agenda setter, anyone can be uh, forming opinions on, on many different things, and there really is no ownership over uh, good ideas. So perhaps a way to ignite imagination and solve some of these social problems is just to put ideas out there and allow people to converse around them and build uh, communities and allow a little bit more time to understand the problem and whose problem is it. Uh, there's a person that should be happy after using a tool that comes out of social innovation and that person we as social innovators or whoever is doing it, they have to understand the needs of that person. So borrowing, in a way, a concept from design thinking, the empathy uh, for the user and having many uh, feedback loops, many iterations until you can get your product, whether it's a web or a mobile app, just perfect for that user with that specific problem. So I think it uh, takes a little bit more time uh, a little bit more readiness to uh, not stick to your original idea, no matter how brilliant you, you as a developer thought it would be, and really bringing together teams with mixed skills. Um, so 
allowing people to to merge into teams where uh, collectively their skills are enough to address uh, the problem at hand. What we are doing in Montenegro is not as exciting as I just described, but definitely not um, capable enough to uh, employ design thinking. But we are uh, w turning again to the citizens, and uh, I'm not saying to the NGO community, because somehow I feel that the NGO community, the biggest, the toughest, the most uh, prominent players have lost the connection with the grassroots, and they've become hybrids of uh, between political organizations and NGOs. So we uh, we were really uh, seeking um, out citizens' views on the problems they face when interacting with the public administration, and it came out that they really care about basics. Uh, services, access to health, access to education, uh, online virtual libraries. Uh, they would really like to know uh, when they uh, approach uh, the administration with a claim or a request, how that process is going. So they, in a way, want to monitor the public administration and, and see how their matter is being resolved. Um, so these are some of the specificities that, uh, that we are um, dealing with. But we will be working on creating teams with mixed backgrounds and mixed skills because we feel that might help us address uh, some of these um, issues. Thank you. So from the two first voices, I, I heard definitely the how, however lame it sounds, the permission to fail and like acceptance of mistakes, uh, it is one of the crucial factors here. Do you have this impression that in your project, in the incubator of social technologies, it, it is somehow implemented and you try to avoid mistakes as, as hard oh, as you can? No, no. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that the permission to fail is the right word. Rather, we what we like to, to do is uh, that we keep in mind always that we have a culture of experiment. So obviously an experiment is, it, it is a fail. It's at least 50% of fail, but most, uh, most often it's 80 or 90 percent of fail and uh, 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 again uh, it, it takes a lot of time and effort so I think that in order to uh, like if we are uh, trying to you know like make innovation more efficient or like the appearance of the innovation in the place where we uh, uh, we want it to appear or uh, so I think that I would agree that we need time we need time, and for those groups where we can, uh, we were planning an innovation to happen. Uh, so, like, we need time so that those ideas, those knowledge, those skills, you know, like, will uh, penetrate uh, to those groups, to those people. Particularly in my in in my uh, project, it's NGO workers, traditional offline activists, and um, then uh, I would relate to. Uh, refer to what Maria said is that people need to see the success the, uh, and it works really fast as soon as the person sees that some tool works efficiently for their for their needs they're like lightning fast in spreading it out among their target audiences among their friends among anything but the, the, the most important thing and this is uh, where uh, where it's crucial for uh, the bridge people, for uh, development organizations, for uh, hacker groups, is to make this success story happen in front of the uh, uh, person who was not exposed to innovation before. Uh, and I think that th this is a very important, this, uh, this uh, moment when actually the magic happens, but uh, this magic is already created by the person who didn't know he or she could, could actually do this. Um, and we uh, ran three social innovation camps in Russia last year. Uh, both of them, uh, all of them were, uh, let's say, effective. But because they were in different cities, they were not in Moscow, uh, it was one time thing. They opened up a little bit of this brand new technological world for the traditional activists. But the problem with it was that, you know, like events like this come and go. And you, in order to ferment this culture of experiment, of innovation, you have 
a, repeat, a repeating set of, uh, of events. And uh, uh, meetups looks like a really great thing. And about speaking about innovation where you are not expecting from, for example, uh, starting this year, we have very small uh, meetup activity in Moscow. And uh, the person who runs these meetups is from Minsk. A country where, you know, like you wouldn't, due to the political uh, situation, you, you wouldn't, you know, like stereotypically speaking, expect an innovation, but you know, like that Belarus hackers are among the uh, the most proficient hackers, both in good and bad sense. We have uh, Alexei here who was presenting the, in the last um, uh, panel. Uh, uh, and so, so what Maria, our meetup manager, said, uh, she said like, well, let's just, you know, invite people and simply share some new cool links about the technology and invite whoever wants to come and, uh, and make it uh, repeated so that people would come and would uh, say, uh, it's about group therapy, but with technology. People would say about the problems and then some people say, oh, well, there is an app for that. So, um, yeah, I think that these kind of activities are very, could be really beneficial if really put on a regular basis so that they actually create the knowledge and the uh, culture of uh, creation. Thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> that's very interesting. Like, there is an app for that. Uh, what is my... Uh, what I've seen when working on new projects for solutions for the problems uh, was often uh, that I was under the impression that they don't work on the exact problem. Like that there is like the, the problem lies somewhere else. However, there is an app for that. So let's use the app, not focusing of like how to how to solve the exact problem. So if it is uh, possible to be implemented without too much thinking about it, so we just focus on a tool, not on the problem. And this is one of the uh, biggest concern of this Ignite moment, that, okay, we have a solution, and there is nobody who will be this grumpy cat and say, stop, no, it's not the problem. The solution might be interesting, but it's not the real problem. And it just destroys the whole, um, the whole atmosphere of doing something right and something exciting and something fun. Uh, but I personally believe this is very imp important to have this pessimist uh, in the room and uh, let them speak uh, for the tool to be sustainable. Because the tool can be, the tool can be super fancy, like extra appealing. However, it's not the solution for the right problem. So, when to think about um, the the moment when we have people with problems and people with solutions is also uh, how not to take the first obvious answer. I believe, and this is also about innovation because as we, as we started, one solution doesn't fit all. So, uh, so maybe this is also something uh, to remember when creating such a, a such an event or such a project <laughs> as well. So, before we pass our voice to um, to the public, I have the last question, like the last official question, and this is since we're in personal democracy forum about Central and Eastern Europe. So, my question here is maybe obvious. Is there something in Central and Eastern Europe to take into consideration when doing social innovation uh, or organizing social innovation events? Um, do you think, like from your perspective, Michal, you, you're very experienced in running different social innovation events in different countries around the world. Uh, so have you occurred different conditions here? Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, so, so this, this uh, calls for a slightly longer answer. Uh, so my experience with... Uh, I, I started running trainings, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, nine years ago. Uh, and uh, I, I, I saw something going on between people in the group. Something uh, 
very interesting, something, and I was running those trainings here in Poland. Um, and uh, I saw some process, I didn't understand it. Mm. Then I went to trainer school, uh, and for a year I was, uh, I was learning what's going on between those people, and why do they learn, or why do they leave the room being enraged, or why do they uh, cry when they, when they finish the, the hackathon meetup, whatever, like, why those emotions are kind of synchronized? Uh, in between people, and why why some people do not synchronize with with the rest of the group, uh, and I kind of got all the theory behind it, behind exper experiential learning and and uh, all those interesting uh, things, uh, and then I uh, after a few different trainings that I've run here in Poland, uh, I went to. Um, mm, to uh, I don't remember if it was uh, I think it might have been India uh, and uh, there was a workshop there where, when I where I was participating and also facilitating and I saw with with a mix of people who were totally different coming from many different backgrounds uh, I saw exactly the same thing that I saw here uh, so to some extent I would say people are, I know this might sound uh, kind of uh, lame, but <laughs> people are the same everywhere. Uh, and of course there are, there, there are cultural backgrounds, there are, there are specific uh, things that will work in one background that will not work in another. Uh, mm, but uh, mm, I personally at the level that I'm interested in, because of course I'm, I'm waiting for, uh, for others to, to talk about their perspectives, but on the level that, that I'm interested in, uh, I don't think there is anything very specific. It, I was to look for something specific anyway, I would say, you know, the, the, mm, the experience of, of totalitarian uh, um, systems basically makes people a little bit bit uh, more closed, a little bit uh, less eager to share, to communicate. And for me as a facilitator, it takes more effort to break through this wall. But apart from, you know, the same, the same symptom might, might appear in completely different circumstances because of completely different uh, reasons. So I tend to think there is no difference. I tend to think we are all the same, and uh, so far it worked. One day I might trip on this on this idea, but so far it's. So Maria, we together we participated in tech camp in Sarajevo, and uh, this is um, a format, a design in Department of State uh, of United States, and uh, in the evaluation we got. Um, the information that the trainers felt like they are teachers more than they are uh, just enablers. It's like top down, not we are all equal. It was a tech campus, a bit Barkham style. So uh, the participants, um, ideally, of course, they have the same right to participate and the, to share knowledge, and they are equal in the level of knowledge, like ideally. And um, in the evaluation, it was repeated that the trainers felt like we lecturers. And it is um, expected from us, from the group of participants, not from organizers, but from participants, uh, to teach, actually. So this is uh, something that um, I've seen of working of um, a format that was designed somewhere else. I don't know if you felt that way as well. It's great that <laughs> you think that we are all the same, but I actually noticed some differences too that are rooted in the uh, educational and political and social context of our part of the world. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that knowledge was totalized um, here uh, where, we, where we live, and I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we were raised in a system where there's one uh, book and whatever the teacher says is correct and really people would frown on alternative thinking so really not much room for critical analysis 
Um, it pains me to say that, but it's something where I grew up in, and I've really had troubles adjusting to a different type of educational system. For example, when I, when I, when I went to the UK to do my, my master's, I was, after a two-hour seminar, I was waiting with my pen, and I was old, older then. I was waiting for my pen to write down the correct answer and there was no one. The teacher would just say, I leave you to make up your own mind. So we, we, come, we come with that upbringing. Um, political context, of course, the one party system, uh, let's not dwell on that. The social context, um, some of the most recent findings on social capital in Montenegro, for example, uh, tells us that um, people like stability and predictability of the public administration. 80% of Montenegrin parents would love their kids to work in the public administration. Uh, there's really low mo mobility um, uh, rates amongst citizens. Uh, usually they feel that you're only supposed to change job once or twice in a lifetime, um, and they remain encapsulated in their small uh, networks of, of family and friends, and this is where they turn for information and for advice on how to get things done and how to solve problems. And this makes diffusion of, uh, of ideas uh, and diffusion of, of knowledge and capabilities very, very hard. So I, I do not wish to finish this panel on such a pessimist, pessimistic note, but there are definitely specificities that come with, uh, with these types of um, environments, unfortunately. Alex, your experiences? Well, I, I think that every region is different in a way. Uh, uh, but I, my point here is, first of all, that if we're speaking of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and obviously since I'm here, so probably Central and Eastern Europe plus Russia. Um, so um, if we look at the definition of C in, in Wikipedia. So I think that it's important to understand that the, the, the whole region is pretty pretty much differentiated. And there are, like, uh, there are environments where things are considerably worse. Uh, and I'm speaking about not just Russia, but also like almost all countries of the uh, Eastern uh, uh, Partnership of the European Union. So like uh, o o everything that is considered in Eastern Europe uh, c and including South Caucasus. And I think that here is, and I think that if divided by this, so there are like uh, two, two uh, different uh, environments. And I, I don't say that uh, we should put them into one bag. But what what we have, I guess, both uh, in in both parts of the CEE, I would say that um, I think that this uh, this past uh, that on one hand we had a very rigorous authoritarian administration. Uh, on the other hand, still there is a pretty high high internet penetration. and still pretty high uh, uh, developed, uh, at least. Uh, Part of it, uh, tax, uh, tax science stuff. Uh, at least in some part, of course, it's it's a really fast uh, degrading uh, in many uh, par parts of the region. But w what is important, there are still like lots of uh, hackers that are, of course, some emigrated, but still like the, there is still some possibilities to innovate. And I think that this is important. This what were actually uh, the, w what is important in in, in particular CE. Thank you very much. Uh, we're not finishing. This is the, I, I'm very glad that we're just in time. Um, so the question to the audience, uh, any comments about social innovation? Any comments about uh, what was said here? Or maybe your best practices in social innovation or your biggest inspirations? Uh, so a comment and a question. My comment uh, refers obviously to what was said earlier on about the fact that uh, some, like traditional, so to say, NGO has have lost constituency and governments tend to turn to citizens to solve because citizens are, you know, interested in ba in solving basic needs and so on. And I, as a narrative, I find it rather to be honest with you, rather unfortunate. First of all, because it is condescending and it basically says that uh, citizens are only, you know, care about breed, but uh, 
um, at least as even the Middle East have shown, it is uh, about bread as it is about human dignity when people uh, choose to react. Uh, further on, uh, I think that what uh, somehow related to this, and I would uh, I would uh, be interested to to hear the the opinion of the panelists is what do you do with this uh, with these uh, hackathons and how do you actually make them work after? Because what I found uh, extremely important for an organization, rather new or old, <laughs> traditional or less traditional, funky or whatever. Uh, I think that um, it would be interesting for us to be able to, you know, to have our own private hackathons and to be able to bring uh, with us on long-term uh, programmers and understand that they are, as I, I got to find out on so many occasions, uh, a different breed and they need to see the, uh, in what way their, capa their technical capacity can change the world through, at the end of the day, on many occasions, an NGO. So I think this would be something that we, we, we should look to in the long run, because we are, you know, we are bringing into, ad, into our advisory boards, uh, I don't know, people from big auditing firms, lawyers, and so on. How are we, how can we have, you know, teams of, of uh, programmers, of, uh, of coders that would stay with us uh, in the long run, so that we have our, as I said, our own very private hackathon on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we answer this question, is there any other comment? Yeah, there is here. Hey, my name is Heath. I'm a tech expert. I live in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, similar to what she was just saying, I, um, I really like the example about the, uh, the people who show up for a website and walk away with some Android app or something. And I, I think that um, there's a, f a lot of failure happening to kind of sell developers on the goals of what, uh, of the purpose of these hackathons are. People show up and, you know, developers want to look at code. That they like thinking about technology, but they haven't kind of made the next step to why they're, they're working on it. Um, and I, I think It'd be interesting to hear on, like, specifically what you think about how we can better sell the, the purpose. Yeah, so this is connected to Madalena's question, pretty much, how to build upon. Any other? Okay. I think. Just a second. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mate de la Corda. I come from Institute for Electronic Participation from Slovenia. As far as social innovation is concerned, I see a comment. I, I see a huge um, need for people who are, who are making bridges between context, uh, what the application should be about, and the computer, the geeks. So in my experience, you have to explain the, the IT guys what do we need. And we are lacking people to do that. So you need like bridge people, I call it bridge people, uh, who understand the concept, what is needed in society, and who can translate this concept in to, the, to the geeks, to the computers, in a sort of a code. When you have this link done, I think it's great. I think that we should put more, more education, more awareness, more um, focus on this type of, type of people, the connectors. The connectors, the bridge people. That's like one of the biggest point probably of from this uh, from this panel. So guys, can you answer the question of uh, how to make IT people, hackers, being more enthusiastic on the ba daily basis, not only the moment of the hackathon? I'll try to jump in since I'm really excited about this topic, so <laughs> I'll go first. Um, and you're a hacker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, actually, who thinks uh, hacker is a good word? <laughs> oh, there you go. It's a very specific <laughs> company, <you> remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Agatha, actually, can you show the hacker space uh, website that we prepared? Okay, so this is the website of Warsaw Hacker Space. Actually, uh, this is the website of Warsaw Hacker Space, which in longer term will have ambition to become uh, like a hub for Polish hacker spaces, but for now it's, you know, the localization is Warsaw and 
the news are from, from Warsaw Group. Uh, and so, so um, I'll, I'll go around with, with uh, those recipes for connecting with hackers. First of all, uh, look for do-it-yourself, hacker space, fab lab groups in your region. Uh, I, I, I'm a co-founder of of, uh, um, of Warsaw Hacker Space, and there is like there is a really amazing group of people uh, there. They are all resourceful, uh, and they also they are active. Part of their activity converts into making uh, amazing machines, which are useful for nothing, but they are like plus 20 points to respect among peers. And that's totally fine, that's absolutely fine, right? This is like a pool of, of creativity, which does not always use its creativity to change the world. It's fine. Uh, so first of all, kind of try to, try to find a group which uh, already does what you, what you need. And show them your, your needs, show them your, um, your, um, your problems. There is no guarantee, but there is a great chance some of the members of the hacker space of a hackers meetup group will decide, okay, that will be fun. Let's go and solve some problems of an organization. Um, Second of all, this communication that I was uh, that I was mentioning, and I would I would kind of uh, mix two two questions: the connectors. Uh, I strongly believe, again, I underline believe, that the communication between uh, the, those those mythical geeks, technical people, and those uh, again normal people. Uh, I strongly believe this communication can happen. Uh, although, those groups are, are pretty much different. They have different cultures, they have different... Uh, mm, different almost everything. Uh, and, uh, but I saw, I saw examples of great communication between those two groups. Uh, I, I really saw that, so I can tell you this can happen, although it is difficult. It requires a lot of goodwill from both sides and a lot of communication, a lot of break, breaking barriers. Uh, so one, one, of the, one of the ways is to have, a, have this connector person. And mm, again, this is also not an easy way uh, because there is real... Uh, real lack of, of such people who, who could be in between. And I, again, I, I was watching many different efforts to create, let's say, a, 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 a group of such people. I don't know who heard about e-riders or circuit riders. There was a really, there are some people, yeah. Uh, so there was a really, really um, lots of effort to, to kind of educate and, and create certain class of people who would be, who would create this link between technical community, they would be technical people uh, in some cases themselves uh, for organizations, for, for social movements. Yeah. Uh, I'm running. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> mm, okay, uh, so just to wrap up. Uh, I would start with actually organizing a private hackathon invite some geeks, uh, put some cookies on the table, uh, spend 15 minutes telling them what the problem is, and this might turn really well. I mean, it might not turn well, but <laughs> you need to take chance, chances in order to innovate. So that would be my, uh, mm, my advice. Alex? Well, I, I think that, like, the, the Having a hackathon every day in your organization, I guess this is a destination point uh, of any social innovation. I mean, like so that any problem solving would be a <laughs> would be made in a, some kind of a local hackathon. <laughs> I think that 
this is one thing and also like the idea of actually addressing problems in a new way and in the kind of discussion and uh, uh, not attaching only web technology that we're mostly speaking of but there are lots of areas of science that I that had major breakthroughs in the last uh, five or six years due to the computer technology and like w w we should start from psychology to social science to network analysis to neuroscience and all these new fields of study because there are a huge amount of new knowledge uh, that it slowly spreads uh, like uh, if we integrate it add it to the web technology that we're currently speaking about uh, all and uh, for example do such hackathons but in, in other fields, I think that this could actually uh, put the social innovation on a brand new level. Thank you. Maria, your last words in this panel. Okay, <laughs> I thought you said my last words ever, oh. <laughs> which would be unfortunate. So to answer the question on how to make these things matter after a hackathon is finished and everybody uh, goes home, we were actually always thinking about uh, continuing after the event itself by way of providing mentoring and nurturing to these products, which, because Hackathon is limited in time, can only produce a minimum viable product. So these things have to evolve and they have to be tested with, with the users, with the people who will actually hopefully someday benefit, benefit from these tools. So there, I think, lies the benefit of working for an international development organization. Uh, we have UNDP, as it is working with the government, has a lot of convening power and a lot of partnership uh, partnerships already built um, across, across the board. So our idea is that we would probably work harder after the event itself to anchor these, these new tools and approaches into our existing projects and really create a favorable environment for co-production of services between the citizens and the government, which would ultimately change the dynamics between these two groups, hopefully. Thank you. That's optimistic. Like, there was this uh, fear that we will finish uh, with some pessimistic um, future. And thank you, Maria, for making it optimistic and bright. And uh, thank you all for coming. I would like to thank our volunteers. Uh, and uh, Agata, who helped with uh, the computer, I don't want you to stay unrecognizable. And um, I hope this uh, discussion will somehow happen more because uh, it's not about only about Ignite, but also to evaluate whatever happened and then to teach and learn uh, what is the best practice, what works where. And I hope that uh, you learned at least half of what I learned here. So thank you, thank you, Michal, Maria, and Alex. And uh, let's go for coffee. Thank you, Anya.